Well, welcome again. So glad that you're here. For those of you who are in the room tonight, again, my name is Scott Lawrence. I know y'all are probably going, why are you saying that again? But it's because we have people joining us online, watching on YouTube, listening to the podcast later. Hey, for those of us in the room, will you give it up for the people who couldn't be here tonight, but they're watching later? Part of our Keys Church family online. Here's the thing, through the miracle of technology, we have people who I know don't even live in the state of Florida, but wish they could be a part of Keys Church. <laughs> and so I had, I had a friend of mine text me this morning and said, are you live streaming or do I have to wait till tomorrow? I was like, you got to wait till tomorrow, man. It's not live stream. But you can, you can check it out anytime you miss on a Sunday. We'll have our services up at 10 a.m. on Monday morning. And so we know we got people watching online. So glad that you're here with us as well. But I'm excited because we are kicking off our very first sermon series tonight. And uh, I won't normally do this, but I'm going to explain kind of what a sermon series is because, I mean, we're only two weeks old as a church. And some of you may be like, what's a sermon series? I've never heard of such a thing. But for us here at Keys Church, for the majority of the time, we're going to teach around a specific topic. And we'll talk about that topic for a few weeks in a row, typically three to four weeks. So think of it as one message broke up into three or four parts. And we just call that a series of messages. And so our very first series is called Mastering Mountains. And I'm so excited to jump into this message with you all tonight to kick this off. We're going to be in this series for the next three weeks. But on the back of that connection card that you have in your seat is a spot to take notes. And I'm going to encourage you to do that because I believe that note takers are difference makers. Come on, somebody. It gives you an opportunity to go back. That was cheesy pastor speak. I know it was. I apologize for that. But it gives you an opportunity to to go back um, and to recap and to kind of look over what it is that God's saying through his word. So I hope that you'll take notes tonight. If you are, the title of my message tonight is this, it is fix your eyes, fix your eyes. And so the idea of this series, Mastering Mountains, it comes from this idea that each and every one of us, we all face different trials, different difficulties, different circumstances in our lives that feel a lot like mountains. Because just like mountains are big and they're immovable and sometimes feel insurmountable, so does our trials and our difficulties in our life tend to feel the same way, don't they? And so tonight, I'm I'm going to kick us off talking about trials. I'm going to talk about two things that I believe are true about trials for every person on the planet. And the first one is this, the trials are difficult. And I think that we would all agree with this. Nobody's going to push back on the idea that trials are difficult. As a matter of fact, Webster's Dictionary defines a trial as this, a test of faith, patience, or stamina through subjection, to suffering or temptation. Nobody likes suffering. Not one single person. Right? Nobody likes test. Can I get an amen? Like nobody likes to. If you do, come on. I mean, we love you anyway. You're still welcome. But come on. Nobody, nobody likes test. We know that this is true. No, nobody likes trials. Trials are difficult. Not only are they difficult, trials are not optional. They're not optional. At some point in your life, you are going to to face trials and difficulties. And you may be thinking to yourself, now, Pastor, that's not very positive. Well, guess what? I am positive that at some point in your life, you're going to face trials and difficulties, okay? There you go. Like, it's going to happen. We know this because life doesn't call ahead and say, hey, would you like some trials and difficulties? That's not what happens. It just tends to sit on your lap, right? Work slowing down and getting laid off is not optional. Your marriage spiraling out of control and your spouse leaving you, that's not optional. Going to the doctor thinking you get a regular checkup and you find out that you have cancer, that's not optional. Raising your children up in the way you know they should go, but then one day them just leaving everything that you've ever taught them and becoming somebody you don't even recognize, that's not optional. Losing a loved one, whether it was expected or unexpected, is not optional. We know this. We all face trials. We all face difficulties. We all face mountains. Every single one of us. Every person in this room has faced different trials, different difficulties, different mountains in their lives. We could literally get in a single file line and walk across the stage and I could hand you a microphone. And every person in this room could tell her of a trial or a difficulty that they're either going through, that they have gone through, or they know that they're about to go through. And they would all be different. Don't worry, we're not that church. I'm not about to make you come on stage and tell people all about your business. But we know that this is true, right? 
trials, difficulties, they come in all shapes and sizes. All mountains are different. Did you know that when it comes to real physical mountains, that there are over a million known mountains in the world? There are over 73,000 named mountains in the United States alone. And so you have your, you know, your bigger, your more prestigious mountains, like everybody knows about Everest and Nepal, or the Matterhorn and the Alps, or you know, in the United States, everybody knows about the Smoky Mountains or the Rocky Mountains. But then you have some smaller, more obscure mountains, um, like this one. This is beautiful Chiha Mountain. Come on, that's a, that's a nice word, right? Chiha Mountain. And guess where this is from? The wonderful state of Alabama, where I'm from, okay? Maybe if you're new, you didn't know I was from Alabama, that's where the accent's from. Come on. This is beautiful Chiha Mountain. And if you've never seen a mountain in person before, you go and you see this and you're like, man, that's, that's beautiful. I mean, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty high point right there. But here's what we know. A mountain like this, there's, I mean, there's really no comparison from Chiha and then a, a mountain like this, like Mount Everest, the tallest and one of the most deadly mountains in the entire world. And we would never try to compare the two because we know, well, at the end of the day, there really isn't a comparison between those two mountains. But how often in our lives do we compare our trials, our difficulties, and our mountains with other people's? I mean, have you ever caught yourself thinking something like this or hearing somebody say something like this when somebody loses their job? It's like, yeah, I mean, they lost their job, but like their spouse has a good job. So it's like not nearly as big of a deal as if I would have lost my job, you know? Or, yeah, I mean, they're getting a divorce, but they've been unhappy for years. Like, everybody knew that they were unhappy. This was not a surprise to anybody. But, like, my spouse telling me they were unhappy, it, like, blindsided me. Because everybody thought that we were happy, and all of a sudden I'm finding out that they're unhappy. Right? We hear this kind of stuff, and we think these kind of things, even if we don't want to, right? We think things like, well, I mean, if they just walked a mile in my shoes, well, then they would understand just how easy they actually have it. And yet we can't, we can't think that way. We can't allow that kind of thinking to come into our life. And here's kind of a, a baseline for us in this series as we go, go forward over the next few weeks that I want all of us to keep in mind, to keep in front of us, and it's this. Uh-oh, I double-clicked. Every mountain is an obstacle for someone. Every mountain is an obstacle for somebody. Now, I don't know, um, you probably can't tell from down there because, like, the lighting's real good and stuff, but, like, I'm not the most physically fit person on the planet, you know? Like, uh, not really looking like I'm about to run a triathlon. But here's the deal. If you were to say, hey, Scott, we're, we're going um, to go climb Chiha Mountain or we're going to go climb Everest, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm out on both. Like, I'm good. Like, I don't want to do either one, right? But here's the difference. If you were going to climb Chiha Mountain... It's about five or eight miles, depending on which trail that you take. It would only take you a few hours, right? If you're going to go climb Everest, when you used to be allowed to, they're not allowing anybody to do this right now, but back when you could climb Mount Everest, you know, Everest is about five and a half miles above sea level. About 20 plus Empire State Buildings tall, 29,000 feet high. And if you were going to climb Everest, it would take you 10 days to get to a place called base camp where you would have to stay for two weeks to let your body get acclimated to the altitude before you could continue to climb. And there would be several other stops along the way before eventually you could get to the summit of Mount Everest, which would take you years of training and about two months. I don't know about you. It's a hard pass for me. (laughs) Like Like I'm good, right? But here's the thing. If by some miracle you convinced me to go on a hike with you, which is highly unlikely, I'm just telling you, your pastor's probably probably not going on a hike with you. But if by some miracle you convinced me, and we're hiking, and it's hot, and we're walking uphill, because I don't know if you can tell, like I didn't, I was like the short end of the jeep, jeep, I got short stubby legs, right? So like these legs are like, whew, they're tired, right? Like my calves are burning, and I'm struggling, and I'm breathing hard, and I'm sweating. The last thing that I want is for you to look at me and say, well, at least it's not Everest. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) You know, like, I know it's not Everest. You don't have to remind me it's not Everest, but how often do we do this to each other in life? Where somebody's going through a difficult circumstance, and it's like somebody's telling you about their marriage, and you know, it's just difficult. Maybe the spouse has anger issues, whatever it is. And it's like, well, I mean, just be happy that you're married. You're not single, you know? 
It's like, I mean, come on. Like, somebody's telling you about how, man, their job is so difficult and it's getting them to spiral and depression and anxiety and they just wake up sick to their stomach to go to work every day. And it's like, well, you, should, you make good money. You should just be grateful you have a job. Like those kind of things, we think that we're trying to encourage people, but it doesn't encourage people. It, it demoralizes them. Because what we're doing when we do that is we are comparing mountains. And this is what we have to do. We have to stop comparing mountains. We cannot compare the mountains in our lives to the mountains in other people's lives. Because just because something is a molehill to you does not mean it's not a mountain to somebody else. And something that may be a mountain to you may be a molehill to somebody else. Because maybe for you, it's not a big deal that you go to a job that you hate every day because you really are just glad you have a job. Or maybe it's not a big deal with you and your spouse have fights because you know divorce is off the table, but not everybody is in that same situation. We all have different, different trials, different things that we face, different mountains in our lives. And what did we say at the beginning? We said that we all face mountains. So guess what? If you haven't faced yours yet, it's coming, like I'm just telling you. And so the question that I want us to ask, that, that I want to answer tonight, is this. If that's the case, then how should we view our mountains? How is it that we should view the mountains in life, these trials and these difficulties that get in front of us. And so we're going to look in Scripture tonight, and we're going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians is actually a, a letter to the church in Corinth written by a guy by the name of the Apostle Paul. And fun fact, it's actually the fourth letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth, but we only have two of them. <laughs> That's why it's called 2 Corinthians and not 4 Corinthians. And Paul's writing here, and he's actually having to defend himself a little bit because people are critiquing and criticizing him, saying things like that Paul's not really an apostle, that he's not really called by God, but there's no way God's really using him because of all of the trials and difficulties that Paul had faced in his life, specifically after he came to faith in Jesus, because Paul had faced more than his fair share of mountains. And so we're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, um, chapter 4, Verse 2, and um, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to open that. If not, my wife Kirsten calls this the Bible in the sky, so it will be up here for you to look at, okay? But this is what it says. It says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. So Paul says, okay, so we're not losing heart, even though we're facing these trials, even though we're facing these circumstances, even though we're looking at the mountain, we don't lose heart, even though on the outside it doesn't look good. The marriage is rocky. The finances aren't looking great. Maybe your health's not so good. On the outside, I mean, we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. In other words, every day God's giving you the strength that you need to face the mountain that's in front of you. Paul's saying here, hey, you have what it takes. He continues on and he says this. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I find it so interesting that of all people in the world, the Apostle Paul would use the word light and momentary to describe trials, but specifically his trials. Because I told you, Paul had faced his fair share of mountains. And just to name a few, at the point in which Paul's writing this letter, he had been beaten with rods three times for preaching the gospel. He had been stoned to the point of death where they thought he was dead one time for preaching the gospel. He had been shipwrecked on three different occasions. That's a whole other story in of itself because I don't know about you, but if your boy gets shipwrecked once, you're never catching me on a boat again. Okay, like it's never happening. But Paul was shipwrecked on three different occasions. As a matter of fact, he was adrift at sea day and, day and night by himself on another occasion. And yet Paul calls our trials light and momentary. What does that mean for me and you? Well, it means whether we want to hear it or not, this is true, that our mountains are momentary. The mountains that we're facing in life are momentary. And I know that that like, it stings when you're in the middle of the situation. It's not what you want to hear. 
when you're dealing with the cancer, when you're dealing with the loss, when you're in the struggle of your marriage, when, you're, when your child's a prodigal and they've walked away, like we don't want to hear that our mountains are momentary. But remember, Paul said, we're achieving an eternal glory. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth here. And he is reminding them that we have an eternal glory. This life is not all there is. That we have eternal life in heaven one day with our heavenly father. And in the grand scheme of eternity, our mountains will not even be a blip on the radar of eternity. And this is what Paul is reminding us. And he continues on and he says this. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul says that we have to fix our eyes, and he means we got to redirect, right? And we can't look at what is seen. We can't look at the mountain. We can't look at the trial. We can't look at at the divorce or the job loss or whatever it is. Instead, we have to turn our eyes. We have to fix our eyes on what's eternal. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus. This is what Paul is trying to get us to understand. And here's what I believe. I believe that we do have to fix our eyes. But I don't mean fix like what Paul's talking about by changing our direction. I mean fix like they broke, okay? Like we need to fix them. And before I was a pastor, I was a plumber. No, that is not like a, hey, I got a plumbing question after service. Just kidding. Like you can ask me a question. But I was a plumber, and so I would go to people's house, and I would fix things that were broken, right? Broken water lines, broken toilets, broken sinks, you name it. Whatever it was, I had to do a plumbing it was broke. We fixed it. That's, that's the word fix that I'm talking about here because our eyes are broken. Our eyes will lie to us. And we know that this is true, don't we? I mean, just think about it in, in, in this sense. Um, how many of you at Thanksgiving have put too much food on your plate? Anybody? Come on. It's coming up. Everybody knows. Because you've been waiting all day. You've been waiting all day for the food to get cooked. And you go and you put all this food on your plate and you sit down and you go to eat and you don't even eat half of it, right? And I don't know if this is what we say in in Florida because I ain't lived here long enough, but in Alabama we would say, hey, my eyes was bigger than my stomach, okay? (laughs) Like this is what happened. My eyes were bigger than my stomach because our eyes will lie to us. And I think what happens in our life sometimes is that our eyes become bigger than our hope. And there is hope to be had in Jesus. And in just a few verses before what we just read, Paul talks about this hope. This is what he says. He says, We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. I mean, what on earth could give you such a positive outlook in the face of such circumstances? What's because Paul had hope? What Paul's saying here is we're hard pressed on every side but not crushed because we have hope in Jesus. We're perplexed but not in despair because we have hope in Jesus. We're persecuted but not abandoned because of Jesus. We're struck down but not destroyed because we have hope in Jesus. It is that hope that Paul is talking about. See, Paul knew something that we need to know. He did something that we have to do. We have to stop looking at the mountain and start looking at God. We have to fix our eyes. That's how we do it. We stop looking at the mountain and we start looking at God. And I know there may be some of you in this room tonight who, in the back of your mind, you're thinking like, when there's a mountain, maybe the only time I actually look at God. <laughs> you know, like I don't really, I only go to God when there's trouble. But let me submit to you that there is a difference between glancing in God's direction and turning back and gazing at the mountain and then actually looking at God and fixing your eyes on Him. And so I, I want to give us some practical ways to do this because again, this sounds good. Stop looking at the mountain, start looking at God. But how do we do this? So I have some ideas on how we can stop, on how we can stop looking at the mountain. There's three things. If you haven't taken notes, this is the time to do it. If you just want to take a picture when it's all up here, that's great too. But the first thing is this. We have to stop asking why. Why did this happen to me? I mean, why, why did my marriage fail? 
Why did I get laid off? You know, why did my kids, you know, not listen to anything that I say and, and now they're paying the consequences? Why, why, why? And I'm not saying that we don't ever stop and take account of, of the reason that why things happen to us. But when we're constantly asking why, we're not really looking at God. We're still staring at the mountain. We're giving all of our attention to the mountain, asking, why is this happening? Why did this happen to me? We have to stop asking why if we want to stop looking at the mountain. The second thing is this. We have to stop complaining. Because I think we're all guilty of not venting, but complaining, because there's a difference between the two. And it doesn't mean that you don't have one or two people, maybe a small group of people who you can go to and you can talk with them about your life and you can vent. But you know what I'm talking about? The people who every time you get around them, it's like, woe is me. Man, this always happens to me. You know, the sky's always falling. When it rains, it pours. All they ever do is complain about any and everything. You see, when we vent, that's momentary. When we complain, it's open-ended. And it never stops. And if we get in this habit of complaining, what we're doing is we're just keeping the mountain right there in front of us. And we keep giving credit to the mountain. And we keep giving power to the mountain. And we just continue to complain, complain, complain. So we need to stop the complaining. We have to stop asking why. We have to stop complaining. And then the third one is simple. Just don't quit. Don't quit. Because what's easy is to, when the mountain is in front of you, be like... Uh, all right, well, I'm going to hang it up. Like, you know, I fought for my marriage for like two years and I'm just tired. You know, I've been trying to get through to my son or my daughter for like five years and they're just not listening. I think I'm just ready to quit. You know, I've been, I've been working so hard at this job trying to get this promotion. I, I'm, just, I'm just done working so hard. I'm done trying to better myself. I'm just ready to quit. And we can't do that. We can't quit. Because what we think is, we think if we quit, that then the mountain goes away. But that's not true. The mountain's still in front of you. You just chose not to do anything with it. And at some point or another, you're going to have to face the mountain. And so these are three ways that, that we can stop. Stop asking why. Stop complaining. Don't quit. But here's what I know. Just because we're stopping looking at the mountain doesn't automatically mean that we're looking at God. Because our eyes, they have a tendency to wander. And so here's what I believe. I believe you will start to look at God when you spend time with God. When you look at God, you will spend time with God. What does that look like? It looks like listening to worship music and reading your Bible and coming to church and serving and being a part of a small group and spending time with your Heavenly Father. When we spend time with God, we'll look at God. But again, this sounds good, but I want to give us some handles. I, I want to give us some practical steps on how I believe that we can do this. And so I have some ideas on how to start, how we can start to look at God after we stop looking at the mountain. The first one is this, that we have to get quiet. If you've been to church for any amount of time, you're like, you're about to talk about quiet time, and you're not wrong. <laughs> but I think quiet time is like this, this phrase that we use in church that kind of goes over people's heads, and so I'm going to try to simplify it for us. When I say get quiet, I mean, you just need to set aside a time in which you're going to cut off Netflix. You're going to put the phone in airplane mode. You're going to kick the kids out of the room, and you're going to spend some time with God. And don't fall into this trap of thinking that you have to be super holy and that this needs to be an hour a day. If it's 10 minutes, it's 10 minutes. If it's 15 minutes, it's 15 minutes. If it's five minutes, then it's just five minutes. Can I tell you tonight that your Heavenly Father would rather you spend five minutes a day with Him than no minutes a day? And so just making that time, whatever it looks like, to get quiet, to tune out the rest of the world, say, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop. I'm, on the way to work, I'm going to listen to this worship music. You know, while I'm sitting in car line with my kids, transparent, I do this every day. In car line with my kids, I listen to my one-year Bible plan every day. It's just a good time for me. I got the noise-canceling headphones. are perfect, okay? That's a good way to get quiet. But we have to get quiet. The second one is this. We need to get connected. 
get connected. What does that look like? It means making sure that you are a part of a body of believers. Here's our heart at Keys Church. It's for everybody to be involved in a local life-giving church. If you're here and you're a guest tonight and you're like, this is cool, but I'm not sure it's for me, that's okay. Please come talk with me after service. I know another. I know a bunch of other pastors in this community who pastor great churches. We just want you to be a part of a church. We want you to be connected. And another great way to be connected is to do life with people in small groups. Here in just a few weeks, we're going to kick off our first season of key groups, which is our small groups, a place where you can do life with like-minded people. Because when we get connected, we're locking arms with people and they're helping us on this journey to become who it is that God's created us to be. If we want to start looking at our Heavenly Father, we need to be connected with people who are going to help us look at our Heavenly Father. And then the last one is this. Stay committed. Stay committed. Because too often what I think happens is we get quiet once or twice. And then it's difficult, right? Because there's kids and there's life and there's... And so then we just stop. We get connected, but you know, like a hurricane's coming so I couldn't come to church. You know, like there's always an excuse not to come. Or like, I tried a small group and it was awkward, so I never tried a small group again. We can't do that. We need to stay committed. Stay committed. Because if we stay committed, then we're going to be able to stop looking at the mountain and to start looking at God. And I believe that if we do these things, that they will help us fix our eyes. They will help us fix our eyes, not only physically, but spiritually. Because here's what I believe with all my heart. We fix our eyes when our eyes are fixed on God. Your eyes are fixed physically when they're fixed spiritually on our Heavenly Father. And the greatest example of this in human history is in the life of Jesus. Because Jesus faced the most grueling mountain that could ever be faced when He went to die on the cross, a death that you and I deserved for our sins because he was sinless. And Jesus didn't ask why. He didn't complain. He didn't quit. He chose to die on the cross for me and for you. And he was connected with his, with his group, his disciples. And on the night before Jesus was to die on the cross, the night where he was betrayed, he asked his disciples, he said, we're connected, let's go. I want you to come with me to the Mount of Olives. We're going to pray together. Jesus got quiet. And this is what Jesus prayed. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. In the midst of Jesus' trial, while facing the mountain, his eyes weren't fixed on his problem. They were fixed on his heavenly Father. God, not my will, but your will be done. And the next day, Jesus would go, and he would die on a cross. But then he would master the mountain, being raised to life again three days later, defeating sin, death, and the grave, allowing me and you to become children of God, allowing us to have hope. This is the hope that Paul is talking about. You see, this is what we need to realize tonight. Because of Jesus, there's hope while facing the mountain. Whatever your mountain is, whatever your situation is, no matter how bad it seems, we have hope because of Jesus Christ finished work on the cross. Because Jesus has made eternal life available to me and to you. And there is a seat at our Father's table in heaven. And all you and I have to do is go and sit down to step into that relationship. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you walked away a long time ago and tonight's the night that you want to come back. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that. Will you bow your head and pray with me? Father God, Lord, you are good. God, we thank you for Jesus' finished work on the cross. Lord, if there's anybody in here tonight who would say, that's me. God, I, I've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus, but I want to tonight.
I want to have hope while facing the mountains of life. I want to give them the opportunity to do that tonight. Or maybe they're returning to you because they've walked away. Right where you are, you can just repeat this prayer to yourself after me. But know that it's not a prayer that saves you. It's the posture and the position of your heart. But you can pray a prayer like this. Father God, I admit that I am a sinner. And I accept your free gift of salvation. I believe that Jesus lived a life I couldn't. That he died a death that I deserve on the cross. But he rose to life on the third day. Defeating sin, death, and the grave. And I accept the free gift of salvation. Help me to follow you to the best of my ability. For the remainder of my life. I give my life to you. In Jesus name. Father God, for the rest of us in here tonight, Lord, I pray that you would help us fix our eyes on you. God, that that we would spend time with you, God, that we would stop looking at the mountain and we would start looking at you, God, because you are where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Lord, we believe that. And so, God, I pray that you would give us a boldness, God, that you would... Give us a confidence to step out to trust you, God. To not be overwhelmed by the mountains of life, but to always look towards you and to know that we have confidence because of Jesus' finished work on the cross. We have hope, even while facing the mountain. God, I pray for everybody in this room tonight, God. Everybody watching online later, that you would be with them, God. That you would protect them, that you would go before them and behind them. God, that you would give them favor with you and everyone they see and talk to this week, Lord. And that you would bless them. We pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.